Bueno, hola, buenos días para todos. Muchas gracias por su asistencia hoy a nuestra tercera sesión del Seminario Permanente de Lenguas Nativas. Este año el seminario se está inscribiendo con las dinámicas de, de la Cátedra UNESCO. El Instituto Caricuerpo hace parte desde el año pasado de la Cátedra UNESCO de Políticas Lingüísticas y Multilingüismo. Y entonces este año hemos invitado a varios eh, po ponentes de diferentes partes, que de diferentes instituciones que también hacen parte de la Cátedra UNESCO para que nos pensemos alrededor de multilingüismo y políticas lingüísticas. Hoy eh, la presentación la, nos la va a dar el doctor Marius Schwab. Él, es, eh, él no, nos va a dar la presentación en inglés, entonces en breve pasamos, cambiamos de idioma. Su presentación es sobre eh, lengua o idiomas en, en Sudáfrica. Algunos como perspectivas de multilingüismo y políticas lingüísticas con una referencia específica al africans eh, y la noción de lenguas minoritarias. El doctor eh, Marius, eh, su doctorado es en, tra en traducción en la Universidad de Stellenbosch en, en Sudáfrica. También hace la maestría en traducción en la misma universidad y su eh, pregrado tiene, eh, tiene un pregrado en estudios económicos, filosóficos y políticos, pero también en estudios de africans, eh, de holandés y de josa en la Universidad de Stellenbosch. Él también eh, pues es profesor en la Universidad de Africans, en tanto a nivel de posgrado como a nivel de pregrado, en donde incluye eh, escritura académica, eh, planeación de lenguas, sintaxis, semántica, sociolingüística, historia de las lenguas y ciudadanía lingüística desde el Africans y eh, estudios de traducción en el posgrado donde incluyen como traducciones eh, prácticas o interpretación, eh, traducción literaria y también métodos y prácticas de traducción. Entonces eh, vamos a darle la bienvenida al doctor Marius. Mm. Uh, I was just um, welcoming you and uh, thank you for being here. And uh, we very much look forward to your presentation. So um, we were discussing how this takes part into the uh, UNESCO uh, chair on multilingualism and language policy. So welcome to our seminar and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, so that we can um, have the PowerPoint on screen. Um, let me just, okay, there we go. Um, Katrin, could you just confirm that you are seeing the screen? I'm just not sure on this end. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes, we wonderful. See. If, anything, if anything goes wrong, please just shout, then I'll know. Otherwise, I won't know. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you all um, virtually. We're living through interesting times um, at the moment with all the pandemics and things going on around us. Um, as you can see, it's extremely cold in South Africa at the moment. We are right in the middle of winter. So I apologize if I'm shivering and my teeth start chattering. But it's very wonderful to be here with you in such a warm environment and to um, be able to share with you some thoughts on um, multilingualism and language policy, and specifically relating to Afrikaans and the notion of minority languages. I hope you'll see where I'm going with this um, in the course of the presentation. Um, my students always complain that I speak too um, fast when I speak English, because um, English is not my native language, so um, Afrikaans is my native language. Um, English is my second language. Um, so. I do apologize if it's um, too fast, just shout at me and I'll try to slow down ever so slightly. Um, as Katrina has indicated, um, I am Maurice Stuart. I work at the University of Stellenbosch. It's in the Western Cape province of South Africa, um, right down at the southern end of the continent. Um, I've put my email address on the slide. So if you need to um, get in touch with me afterwards, you're welcome to use that. I am appointed in the Department of Afrikaans and Dutch, um, which is also an interesting combination of languages considering this talk today, and you'll soon see why. Um, in the screen on the bottom right hand side, you can see the center of our campus. 
um, with the library specifically. We have an underground library um, under the central campus. Um, and then on the top right hand of my screen, you can see a long building that looks a bit like a boat. And right up on the sixth floor, if you can see my cursor right about there is where my office is. Um, I always find it nice to know where someone's coming from. Um, this is just a little map dot. So you can see where you are relative to where I am, um, right down at the southern end of the continent of Africa. So that's where the University of Stellenbosch is located. Um, for this afternoon's presentation, um, I have indicated a number of main threads. Um, this presentation does not relate to one single specific project that I'm working on at the moment. Um, it is rather a um, overview of some thoughts and inclinations I've developed over the time that I've taught um, language planning and policy as well as social linguistics um, as a part of my departmental duties within the subject of Afrikaans and Dutch. Um, we will start off by looking at the South African linguistic situation before 1994. Um, as you might know, or possibly not, um, 1994 was a very significant um, year in our country's history. It was when we had our first fully democratic um, elections for the governing party. Um, and after that, I'll look at the issue of two parallel education systems as it relates to South Africa and our history. Um, we will mention briefly the way language is treated in the constitution of the so-called New South Africa. People still tend to refer to that as the new constitution, even though it was um, published and proclamated in 1996. Um, I will make some points about the current situation rel relating to multilingualism specifically, and then I'll move on to Afrikaans as a kind of case study and look at Afrikaans um, and its role and position in the higher education environment. I will look at the issue of re-standardization and um, the notion of linguistic citizenship. I will share some of the latest relevant frameworks and language policies with you, um, and then explain something quite close to home in the form of a very short overview of our current language situation at Stellenbosch University, which is somewhat unique. And of course, um, I'm sure we will have some time for questions and discussion after the, um, after the main threads of my presentation. Um, so let's jump right into the first one. Um, the late sociolinguist and language planning scholar Neville Alexander um, once made the very important point where he said that um, if slaves had not been forced to learn Dutch, the language Afrikaans would not have come into existence. Um, Afrikaans was for very often, for very long seen as a European language um, in Africa. It was um, part of a piece of history that I'll get to in a short while to see it as something that was brought to Africa by white settlers and not something local, not something indigenous. Um, and for very long, um, before 1994, um, Afrikaans had two official languages, and these languages were English, of course, and then this language Afrikaans. Afrikaans um, was standardized chiefly from one of three historical varieties of the language. Um, they were known as um, Kaaps Afrikaans, Oostgrens Afrikaans, and Oranjerevier Afrikaans, or Cape Afrikaans, um, Eastern Frontier Afrikaans, and Orange River Afrikaans. Um, it was standardized chiefly from the um, Eastern Frontier variety, um, along with the capital and the monetary power that um, came along with the mining exploration in the northern, northeastern part of the country, um, this form became the dominant form. And right from the start, um, Afrikaans was standardized um, along the lines that were also racially exclusive, because this was a variety of the language spoken almost exclusively by white speakers. Um, English was um, dominant for the latter part of the um, 18th century and um, or 19th century, sorry, and well into the 20th century. Um, the development of Afrikaans was part of a Christian nationalist political ideology of the time. And the idea was to, um, to diminish the effect of the former British colonial rule that we were under 
um, and the idea was to develop Afrikaans so that it could compete with English on an equal footing. The government of the day, specifically the um, National Party government who were elected um, in 1948, were especially um, interested in this and um, invested a lot of money and a lot of effort in um, developing this language. Um, they set up an academy, um, they set up language bureaus to develop terminology and so forth. And um, they also instituted the language in the educational um, environment. Um, but the history of Afrikaans is unfortunately also a history of standardization that was very exclusionary. Um, this variety that the standardized form of the language was based on was always a, a variety spoken by a minority group of speakers by um, less than about 40 percent of the total um, speech community of the language. So um, Afrikaans relates very strongly to Dutch, obviously, and for very long um, other influences on the language were simply denied or not acknowledged, um, whether explicitly or implicitly. Um, Afrikaans was always a language with numerous influences from Malay, from Portuguese, from Arabic. Um, the first Afrikaans that was written was written in Arabic script as well. Um, and from the start of the development of this language, there was this tension between different groups speaking different varieties of this language. Uh, one of the most notable examples of this kind of tension was the establishment of the um, GRA or the GRA. It stands for the Genootskap Verrechte Afrikaners, which means the, um, what shall we call them, the Association of True Afrikaners. Um, this was established in August of 1875. And one of their first major goals was to provide a complete Bible translation into Afrikaans. Um, they also separated three varieties of Afrikaans based on the ethnicity of the speakers at the time. Um, they were big role players in cultivating a variety of Afrikaans that um, also started informing parts of the standard. Um, but the standard of Afrikaans, of, standard, of standardized Afrikaans, was very, very reliant on Dutch at the time. Um, Alexander has referred to this as the gaping hole between the street and the standard. Um, there was also the explicit exclusion of so-called colored speakers or colored Afrikaans or Carps Afrikaans, Cape Afrikaans, as you could call it, um, and the non-acknowledgement of the English influence on Afrikaans. Afrikaans has always been influenced to a great extent by English. Um, but this was not um, politically um, fashionable at the time to acknowledge this. Um, so with the standardization of Afrikaans came a lot of purism, a, a lot of exclusion. Um, for very long, the standard variety was called um, Beskafta, Algemeen Beskafta Afrikaans, or so-called civil, civilized Afrikaans, um, following from the Dutch um, Algemeen Beskaf Nederlands. Um, and all of this, um, contributed greatly to nationalist ideas and ideologies surrounding language um, and the so-called tall straight or language battle. Um, many scholars have written good research and extensive material on this issue. So I'm not going to cover the history of Afrikaans in um, any great depth this afternoon, but it is important for you to have this kind of an overview of the fact that the history of Afrikaans has always been a history marked by um, a measure of conflict and tension between different um, speaker groups. As you know, the um, pre-1994 government instituted the disastrous apartheid policies, whereby people were separated into different parts of the country and even different parts of towns based on the color of their skin. And Afrikaans was also um, in the um, crosshairs in this regard with um, it always having a very diverse speech community and always having had a very diverse speech community that now had to be artificially separated as though there were different kinds of people. So um, one of the most um, explicit ways in which this separation of people into different um, groups was effected was in the educational system. Um, for very long uh, our country had, in practical terms, two parallel educational systems. Um, one system for so-called white students and another system for all students who were not white or seen as white by the government of the day. 
the most explicit form of this um, racist and racialized view of um, education and language in education um, would be the so-called Ban to Education Act of 1953. Um, up to that point, the control of um, so-called black student schools um, had been chiefly in the hands of missions and churches. Um, as a part of the Ban to Education Act of 1953, this control was removed and given to the state. Um, the implicit goal with this policy was to separate children based on the same ethnic lines um, as was being done throughout the country and to give the um, black children an inferior education so as to guarantee a supply of um, cheap labor basically. Much less money was spent in the school system than in the white school system. This was later extended to um, post school training with the University Education Act of 1959, the establishment of so-called Bush universities. You can see the extremely pejorative term there. And later with the Colored Persons Education Act and also the Indian Persons Education Act, as well as the formation of the geographical um, locales called the homelands, which is another um, interesting point. Um, language was used very overtly, very obviously and very clearly to separate people into so-called ethno-linguistic groups. Um, many of these distinctions were artificial more than real or practical, but um, they had a significant foundational importance, <clears throat> pardon me, within the apartheid system, because of course the apartheid system was nothing else than a remnant of the British divide and rule system, whereby you could keep people in a subservient position much more easily if you could split them up into different little groups. Um, Pre-94 South Africa consisted um, in uh, geographical terms, sorry, of um, four provinces um, with Afrikaans and English as the chief official languages. And then there were also the 11 Bantustans or um, they were also known as the homelands. Um, there were the four independent um, homeland states, the Transkei, Siskei, Boputatswana and Venda. And I've put in square brackets within the round brackets the um, main languages spoken in each of those groups. And you might want to make a mental note of these languages because you will see them um, again in a short while. Um, apart from the four independent um, TBVZ states, there were also the so-called self-governing states of Kangwane, Kwandebele, KwaZulu, Leboa, and Kwakwa, um, with their subsequent main languages as indicated in brackets again. The fact that um, Afrikaans was so prevalent in society, including the education system, um, caused a growing stigma of Afrikaans to be seen as the language of the oppressor. Afrikaans was a extremely um, important part of the Christian nationalist ideology of the National Party government of the day. Um, it was the language by which much of the apartheid policies were enforced. Um, it was the chief language of government. Um, and all of this gave Afrikaans this connotation of the language of the oppressor. Um, this also culminated in the Soweto uprisings of 1976 with um, secondary school children um, insisting on being schooled in English because of the greater opportunities and because of the political connotation um, connected to Afrikaans. Um, and one could say that in this um, conflict, which we still, um, we still uh, memorialize today with a public holiday on the 16th of June called Youth Day, um, in this situation, Afrikaans was both a catalyst or one of the causes of the conflict, but also one of the victims, because um, as we all obviously know, um, the Afrikaans was the medium by which this unequal and unjust system was instituted and realized. But of course, no language in and of itself is bad or good or evil or um, positive just for the sake of being a language. Um, it depends on what's done with it. But for the point and for the purposes of this discussion, um, there were big access and inequality issues in the formal schooling system. And um, the primacy of Afro Afrikaans in English reinforced the um, inequality that was such a big part of, um, of the um, country's political um, reality at the time. Um, 
throughout the 80s, there were various groups that started um, looking at what would be done with language in the so-called new South Africa after democratization. Um, it became increasingly clear that the um, emergency situations and the political conflict and the bloodshed um, all in the name of this unjust policy was not a feasible um, solution with a real future. And it became clear that there would have to be some sort of a um, power shift from the nationalist government. And um, in studying these issues, um, we had our first democratic election in 1994, and we received what is generally still seen as our new constitution. We had an interim constitution for about um, a year and a half, after which the constitution of the so-called New South Africa was promulgated in 1996. Um, I'm skipping a lot of the political detail because it's not directly relevant to the point of my presentation, but I would, um, I'm more than willing to answer questions if you have questions afterwards. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. In the constitution of the so-called New South Africa of 1996, um, there was a shift from recognizing two official languages to recognizing um, a total of 11 official languages. Um, I've listed them for you in order of um, size in terms of number of mother tongue speakers um, running from the top to the bottom. They are Isizulu, Isikosa, Afrikaans, English, Seperi, Setswana, Susutu, Kutsonga, Siswati, Chivenda, and Isindebele. Um, these languages can also be grouped according to um, familial clusters, which I'll do a bit later on. But the point is that um, with the new South Africa, with the dawn of the rainbow nation and the government of national unity, ideas which have received much criticism in, um, of late, um, there was for the first time this recognition of 11 languages as the um, official languages of the country. Of course, recognition like this is an extremely important step in building a more just linguistic setup, but um, recognition on its own doesn't mean much if it isn't realized in practical terms and out in the real world. Um, one of the vehicles by which um, the idea was to institute this new multilingual reality was a organization called PANSALB. It stands for the Pan-South African Language Board. It's a functionary of government. Um, and as I've quoted from their website there, um, I will read it to you. The Pan-South African Language Board or PANSALB was established in order to promote and create conditions for the development and use of official languages, the Kwe and Sun languages and sign language. The Kwe and Sun languages are um, our First Nations indigenous languages and sign language. And to promote and ensure respect for all languages commonly used by communities in South Africa, including German, Greek, Gujarati, Hindi, Portuguese, Tamil, Telugu and Urdu and Arabic, Hebrew, Sanskrit and other languages used for religious purposes in South Africa. As you can um, deduce from that um, long list of languages, apart from the official languages, we are a very diverse country in cultural, religious and other terms. And um, for that reason, PANSALB was tasked with ensuring that um, people aren't discriminated against based on their languages. Also, um, the idea was to rectify the ills of the past and to um, ensure access and participation for all people in all levels of South African society. In our constitution, um, it is stipulated that languages should have what is called equity and parity of esteem. Um, it also stipulates a number of possible steps and goals to realize this. Um, many, many theorists and scholars have criticized these um, sections in the constitution as being very vague. Um, Theo Duplessis, for example, says that all of this is somewhat foggy, and he goes back and says that the 11 language model that we have at the moment was nothing more, and I quote, than a compromise between the ANC, our current, um, current governing party, between the ANC's covert English agenda and the overt Afrikaans agenda of the Afrikaner negotiators. Our provinces, we have nine separate provinces, and they have the um, ability and the mandate to legislate language internally. But apart from two of these provinces with the Western Cape being a notable front runner, 
um, this has not really realized in practical terms. We also have a National Language Act, but again, it seems that um, our National Language Act and its related policies aren't um, seen as positive tools by which there is development or the institution of um, language services and um, language offices and the like, but rather as something that is a kind of final resort when you have to take somebody to court because they're not treating your language fairly or correctly. Um, in the constitution, and I'll read you a short um, section from the constitution, we have the following important provision, which is an entry point into the next section of my talk. Um, our constitution says, everyone has the right to receive education in the official language or languages of their choice in public educational institutions where that is education is reasonably practicable. In order to ensure the effective access to and implementation of this right, the state must consider all reasonable educational alternatives, including single medium institutions, taking into account equity, practicability, and the need to redress the results of past racially discriminatory laws and practices. The national government and provincial governments by legislative and other measures must regulate and monitor their use of official languages. So um, if you look at those three points um, specified regarding educational activity specifically, um, number one is equity, number two is practicability, and number three is the need to redress the results of past racially discriminatory laws and practices. And these are three very, very important factors um, in considering, for example, the realities of multilingualism in something like the higher education environment. Um, we have a very important caveat in that first sentence. Um, it starts off by saying everyone has the right to receive education in the official languages, language or languages of their choice, but then it ends the sentence by saying where that education is reasonably practicable. So it is a limited right, it's not an unlimited right. Um, it bears upon what is practically possible. Um, in order to make this complex uh, set of principles a reality in the form of policies and actual practices, um, we have bodies like PANSOB, which I've mentioned, as well as the universities and schools themselves, as well as our education departments and so forth. Um, I'd like to move on to the current realities regarding this constitutional mandate. In the case of PANSTAB, we've seen that their existence has been marred by many problems and issues, including administrative difficulties, political interference, financial mismanagement, and the like. The problem with PANSTAB is probably most pressing for the simple fact that they are a branch of government um, that also has to oversee government in its linguistic activities. Um, furthermore, many scholars have noted that our constitution is a model constitution in terms of the views of the world. It's seen as a very, very good one, but there are serious questions as to whether its language provisions are actually applicable and practicable. Um, what we see in South African society today, um, contrary to what you would expect with such a forward thinking and liberal policy, is that English is by far the dominant language in the formal economy and Afrikaans is still very much in a second place. It plays what um, Neville Alexander calls an ancillary role in many domains. I've listed a few of the chief ones, um, informal education, including um, basic and post-school education, in the financial sector, in publishing and um, in the media in general, Afrikaans is still very strong along with English. And unfortunately, um, we still don't see very much meaningful access to and use of the other nine languages in formal context, um, especially. And also, unfortunately, we don't really see an incentive for speakers of Afrikaans and English to learn those languages in order to gain access to something they wouldn't have had access to um, otherwise. Of course, um, South Africa is also a part of the real world with the very pressing effect of English on all our local languages, but still one would expect that um, 27 odd years after a new constitution, there would have been some more progress. Our current languages, um, the 
11 official languages as well as the other relevant languages spoken by a significant portion of the population can be developed, uh, sorry, divided into a number of clusters. And you'll see why this is important on the next slide. Um, we have the Nguni family, um, including Isizulu, Isklosa, um, Siswati, and Isindebele. We have the Sutotswana cluster, including um, the old southern and northern Sutu, known as Sesutu and Sepedi, as well as Setswana. And then we have the Tsonga and Chivenda, each on their own. We also obviously have Afrikaans and English. One of the proposals um, in terms of Neville Alexander's Langtag group of the late 80s and early 90s, for example, was to um, harmonize some of these African languages and to um, have an additive bilingual program in the schools and further on by which um, all students would um, learn English um, and Afrikaans and one of these clusters of languages um, because they are generally mutually intelligible. Um, that didn't find much traction in practice. Um, we also have the um, San and Kwe languages as indicated. We also have a significant number of users of South African sign language. And then, as I said before, some European and some Indic languages as well. For the rest of the presentation, I would like to focus not so much on the um, other languages, but specifically on the 11 official languages, because there are some interesting um, facts to contextualize the rest of the talk. Um, firstly, I'd like to show you this table. Um, it's made up from the latest um, relevant census data that we have available. Um, and it indicates the um, population of South Africa by their first language and their population group. In other, um, in other census data, you might also call the population group the race or the ethnicity. Um, unfortunately, much of our government um, and their interaction with um, public data is still based on these categories, um, these essentially nationalist apartheid categories, but this is how the data is reported, so um, I will um, present it as such. Um, I'd like to draw your attention specifically to the first row um, where we have the distribution of Afrikaans in terms of mother tongue speakers in the various groups. Um, you'll see that Afrikaans is spoken um, to a large extent by white speakers, um, and that it's also spoken to a very large extent by so-called colored speakers or brown speakers as we refer to them in Afrikaans. Um, and then with very small groups um, of Indian and Asian and black African speakers and quite a significant number of people indicating their um, population group as other on the forms. Um, on the right hand, we have the percentage of the total where we can see that Afrikaans, um, according to that census data, is spoken by about 13 and a half percent of the South African population as a mother tongue. And if you look down the table, you'll see that that means Afrikaans is the third language, uh, third largest language of the 11 in terms of its number of mother tongue speakers. Um, the largest one being fifth from the top is Isizulu, and the second largest one right above that is Ikosa, which is a uh, um, local Nguni language down here in the Cape where I'm from. Um, it's also important to note that if you look at the percentages um, in the top row again, um, that 75.8% of all colored persons in South Africa indicate that their mother tongue is actually Afrikaans. And if you go into the numbers um, of that distribution, you'll see quite clearly that despite the fact that the white variety of Afrikaans, the Eastern Frontier variety, was used to base the standard form on, this is not actually the variety spoken by the biggest proportion of speakers of Afrikaans. Um, and I'll show you how that works in a few slides from now. But yes, um, the important point from this um, slide is that it's not really possible to delimit a single national language in South Africa. The biggest one is spoken by only 22.7% of the population. It is an extremely diverse um, linguistic situation um, with even the smallest one of the 11 being spoken by um, around 2% of the population. And of course, 2% doesn't sound like a um, very significant number, 
but if you consider that it's on a population of around 50 million people, it is a significant number of people. So this is the basic raw data that I'll be referring back to. An interesting um, add on to this is to have a look at where these languages are spoken. And for this, I've um, gotten a very nice map from the Brand South Africa website. Um, and I think the most um, obvious um, notable point um, is the large area in this light green color to the left hand of the map, um, which is the southwestern and northwestern part of the country. Um, it matches very closely the um, borders of the old Cape province. And you'll see that in that very big geographical area, um, Afrikaans is by far the dominant language with small pockets of other languages. For example, down here at Cape Town, at the Cape of Good Hope, there is a little English dot um, there in Johannesburg and so forth. You can see that English is basically dominant in the, um, in the metropolitan urban areas. Um, so up there in the Joburg, Johannesburg, Pretoria area, and down here in Cape Town, you'll see a lot of English. But um, other than that, in rural South Africa, um, it's not a dominant language by any means. You have this big area where Afrikaans is um, a dominant language. And then you have um, Kosa over here in the old um, eastern part of the Cape province, now known as the eastern half of the Eastern Cape. Um, you can clearly see this um, concentration of Isizulu in, in and around KwaZulu-Natal and so forth. So you can see that these, um, these languages, are the, languages are distributed geographically in quite an interesting fashion. Uh, you can also see quite clearly um, if you draw this line through these um, pockets of light green, um, the so-called Witwatersrand, where most of our minds are situated. And this mirrors quite closely the so-called Great Trek of um, the early 1800s. So um, this just indicates how broadly and how widely the various languages are distributed in the country. Um, of course, there are these questions regarding the relative size. I mean, if you're in a situation where you have to pick one language to be the national official language, what would you do? It's not clear that there is any one language that would be able to fulfill that function in South Africa. Um, the historical patterns are also quite visible in this geographical distribution. Um, and this leads one to an interesting question with regard to the notion of minority languages on the one hand, but also linguistic minorities on the other. If you consider that if you add together all the people who speak our two biggest languages um, as a mother tongue or a home language, you're still only around 39% of the population. So um, there's no clear winner in terms of South Africa's main language. Um, that role is fulfilled by English and mostly by English as a second or a third language. So um, English is very widely distributed in that term, but not in terms of um, being spoken as a mother tongue. The issue about minority languages is also interesting for the case of Afrikaans, because in one sense, Afrikaans speakers are certainly a minority. They are less than 15% of the population. On the other hand, as a group, they have um, significant cultural and financial capital, and they are the third largest group of the 11 mother tongue speaker language groups. So um, this problematizes the use of um, scholarship relating to linguistic minorities as used in um, mostly Western contexts. And this is another interesting example of how um, we in the global South need to develop our own epistemologies and methodologies for understanding and um, studying these issues. So um, moving on from this, I'd like to move into a bit more detail about Afrikaans specifically in the higher education um, environment. Since uh, 1994, but especially since the early 2000s, there's been a steady decline in the use of Afrikaans in higher education. Uh, the group of universities called the HAUs or historically Afrikaans universities have all moved away from Afrikaans to varying degrees. Um, most of them have become fully English. Some of them have retained some form of bi or multilingual um, language in teaching and learning. There are some experiments with using translation, interpreting, and other forms of language practice to ensure access. But you, uh, mostly um, universities in South Africa are seen as national assets 
that should be accessible to all people from anywhere in the country. Um, our government does not want universities separated on ethnic or tribal or linguistic grounds because any university should be accessible for any child from any of our schools. Um, there is even some explicit hostility from um, some levels of government regarding Afrikaans specifically. Um, I've brought along a small um, newspaper article. I hope it will show up if I open it up now. For example, this is our Minister of Higher Education and Training, and you can see um, his opinion. There are problems when Afrikaans is used as a means of instruction. Um, of course, this has a longer history in terms of the fact that um, Afrikaans is seen to be a remnant of an apartheid past. Um, many of our um, people in positions of authority see Afrikaans as something that is um, used to bar access to all students, especially previously disadvantaged black students. And for that reason, there's much pressure on um, higher education institutions to limit the use of Afrikaans. Very often, this is also because of the fact that Afrikaans is equated to a white language, which is of course fundamentally incorrect. And apart from this, there's also the large prestige of English in formal contexts, including the educational context. Um, I'd like to show you something interesting relating to this point, and it's a, um, a quote from uh, an, a scholar with the name Herman Gilomir from 2003. At the time, um, many people thought he was being alarmist and ridiculous. He said in 2003, while the Constitutional Court has not yet sat on the issue of language rights, the general impression is that it will be indifferent or hostile to the idea of minority cultural rights and much more interested in the right of the majority to have access to all educational institutions in their language of choice. At the time, um, people thought he was being ridiculous, but this has actually played out exactly in the fashion that um, Gilomir predicted. We've seen a number of test cases of university language policies um, being taken to the Constitutional Court, and without fail, the, you know, the Constitutional Court has favored um, broadening access um, rather than um, having a specific minority and their rights protected in the higher education environment. Um, this is probably in some part related to the outdated notion of the language of the oppressor, this being Afrikaans, but also to the fact that that perception of Afrikaans is still very prevalent in society. Um, since 1994 and the so-called New South Africa, um, our Department of Higher Education and Training um, has built one additional university. And I found quite an interesting illustration of the problems that this attitude causes at ground level for those of us standing in front of classes of multilingual students in a multilingual environment. Um, and I've got the quote in Afrikaans at the top and I've translated it for you at the bottom. And I'm sure that you all as teachers and researchers working in language will see the problem here. I will read it to you. Listen to this. In the Northern Cape, Afrikaans is the language spoken by the majority of people. You, you'll note that on the map I showed you. While Setswana is the biggest language at SPU. SPU stands for Salt Lake University. All South African language groups are represented at SPU but the biggest groups are Setswana, Isikosa, and Afrikaans. Many of the Afrikaans and Isikosa speaking students find it extremely difficult to communicate in English, the medium of instruction in their first year. We accept no question in Afrikaans or Setswana. If a student can't formulate a question in English, a fellow student must translate it into English for them. This is, of course, hugely problematic in an educational environment because for the simple fact that this means students still have unequal access to educational materials and to the educational experience based on the fact that only one language is accommodated in that educational setting. And this problematic is becoming um, a very real issue in um, many of our campuses. Um, at this point, it's probably a good idea just to have another look at who actually speaks Afrikaans and at the composition of the Afrikaans 
um, speech community. Um, if we use the traditional um, racial categories as used by the government at the moment, you can see that the vast majority of Afrikaans speakers are so-called colored speakers with a significant um, percentage of black speakers and then also a large group of white speakers. So um, as Neville Alexander repeatedly said, um, it's not very accurate to see Afrikaans, at least nowadays, as a white language because it simply isn't. Um, but to, to think of this issue um, more productively, one could probably see it in the light of re-standardization and linguistic citizenship. Um, despite the fact that so-called colored speakers are such a big part of Afrikaans speakers and that Afrikaans has such enormous um, value in the South African environment, um, we still see that colored students have the lowest enrollment rate per capita in higher education, for example, whilst white speakers of Afrikaans are part of the richest and most employed and most privileged class in the country. Of course, this is not just the result of language, but language certainly plays a significant part in maintaining it. Um, the TARPs referred to in the um, heading of the slide refers to um, the largest variety of Afrikaans, so-called CARPs or CARPSA Afrikaans. Um, and this is more than just an ethnolect. Um, Frank Hendricks calls it a working class variety. Um, Vic Webb says that um, this is one of the two mutually exclusive parts of the, South, uh, the Afrikaans speech community. And this raises questions in terms of what we should be doing with which version of Afrikaans. Because if the current standard is not based on the version spoken by the largest group of people, isn't it time to stop it and destandardize it and construct a new one, or just leave it in a destandardized state as such? Um, to think about the future of these issues, um, I like to use the lens of linguistic citizenship as um, used by Chris Stroud and others in the South African context, where Stroud says, what we need to solve some of these problems is a political philosophy of multilingualism. Um, he reiterates the fact that despite being a part of one of the biggest language groups in the country, and um, despite understanding one of the most valuable languages, um, colored speakers are still marginalized and they are still discriminated against because of the specific variety of language that they use. Um, and Stroud wants these identities to become empowered, as he says, so, to be, so as to be in a position to access a greater and more equal share of society's symbolic and capital resources. And this is why the issue of Afrikaans and other indigenous languages in higher education is so important. We have the situation at a number of institutions of higher learning where there is an established history of using Afrikaans, where there are significant Afrikaans resources, but for the sake of political, um, what shall we call it, for political gains or political um, acceptability, it seems that there is an orientation of rather removing Afrikaans and having everyone struggle equally um, instead of um, advantaging one part of the population or two parts of the population. We have seen in scholarship that um, focusing only on linguistic human rights does not work very well in the African context. Um, we have many competing rights and many competing communities. Um, and this is why Stroud's notion of linguistic citizenship is probably more useful. Um, Stroud says that linguistic citizenship focuses on a broad articulation between the diversity of linguistic practices and resources that civil society draws upon and emphasizes the participation of linguistic communities rather than a reliance on legal provisions and institutionalization. So basically, um, Stroud's point is that this has to be bottom up rather than top down. Um, Afrikaans speakers, for example, need to live and breathe and use their language if they wanted to um, coexist with the other languages um, and not to be discriminated against. There are many exciting initiatives going on at the moment. Um, I'm not going to show you all of them just um, for the interest of um, staying within the allowed time, but there is um, some interesting stuff going on with CARPS, for example. CARPS has long been, um, not been acknowledged as a part of standard Afrikaans. Um, it has long been discriminated against. 
it's been seen as a kind of a more basic variety of the language. It's not seen as proper Afrikaans. And speakers of this variety have started pushing back against this. Um, one of the interesting um, articles in this regard is by Quinton Williams, a colleague of Chris Stroud's, where he describes the Afrikaans project, which is a project of, um, let me just get all the ads out of the way, sorry, um, which is a movement um, looking critically at the connotations um, connected to cops um, as an act of reclamation. In other words, an act of taking back something that belongs to the speakers of the language. Um, of course, there are always questions about who is allowed to use cops. Um, is it only the, um, the possibility for so-called colored speakers to use it? or are white speakers also allowed to use it? Um, these things have been socially and racially stigmatized for so long um, that we'll see these kinds of articles in um, literature where um, a literary author has started using the cops variety, although she doesn't speak it herself. And there were some criticisms against this because it's seen as a kind of literary blackfacing. Um, one could ask the question of whether cops um, should and can be part of the standard language and how that will be done. Um, this is one of my own former students writing on this very issue. Um, it's in um, Afrikaans, unfortunately, so you'll have to put it through a translation program to be able to read it, but it has an English um, summary. Um, COPS is also used widely in advertising and in media and so forth, as indicated by academic research on the matter. And last but not least, um, there is also the issue of which COPs to include and which of so-called colored speakers language varieties to include in the standard if that is the way to go. Um, the linguistic citizenship orientation towards these issues um, comes down to what Alexandra and other calls a rediscovery of one's roots. Um, of course, one of the biggest problems with the current standardized version of Afrikaans and one of the reasons for its um, lack of traction um, under modern speakers is the name Standard Afrikaans, which means standard Afrikaans. It sounds like something that's a set of rules that you're going to be measured by and that's going to be used to judge you. Um, so there have been repeated calls for the re-standardization and the democratization of Afrikaans by including more language aspects from the various varieties of the language. Um, revaluing not just the components of the language as such, but the very notion of standardization. Um, as you all know, standardization is a hugely problematic issue in our field nowadays, um, starting with um, the book by Ilana Shoemi and even some scholars before a 2006 publication, there have been calls for simply destandardizing language. Um, this also calls for a clearer definition of what exactly Afrikaans is. Um, making Afrikaans something inclusive and something open and not something that is oppositional to the varieties because there are many historical wrongs to put right in the context of Afrikaans, but there's also a lot of potential for using Afrikaans to um, get some of the most um, underprivileged and disadvantaged minorities in our country into a better position by means of using the language that they understand and that has been developed as a full scientific and literary language um, long ago. To get all of this done, of course, um, we will still need official policy and official oversight. So um, in the second to last part of my presentation, I would like to move on to the current situation in terms of the rules governing um, language policy in the higher education environment. Um, I'm going to summarize it for you, but I have included links that you can read yourself. These links are in English. The materials at the links are in English. So you can have a look at them um, if you are interested in learning something more about them. Um, the first two documents that I want to um, show you are the 2017 draft policy on language in higher education in South Africa, and then the 2020 policy framework for higher education in South Africa. And they, um, are a number of important differences between the two, of which I've um, emphasized one specifically. In the 2017 draft policy for higher education institutions, like the one where I work, Afrikaans is stated to be one of the indigenous 
South African languages. It's seen as a language from South Africa with its biggest speech community in South Africa. It developed fully in South Africa and it's used in South Africa. Um, to add to that, the draft policy said the following, mindful of the historically orchestrated underdevelopment and undervaluing of indigenous official languages prior to democracy and the disinclination to empower those languages in the present dispensation, conditions must be created for the valuing of indigenous languages as languages of meaningful academic discourse, as well as sources of knowledge in the different disciplines of higher education. So in the 2017 draft policy, there is a clear pushback against the dominance of English as an academic lingua franca um, by means of what they call revaluing the indigenous languages, the other 10 official languages in our case, as languages of academia. In the 2020 policy framework, which followed upon the 2017 one, um, we were quite upset to note that Afrikaans had been taken out of the list of indigenous languages. It is no longer seen as an indigenous, indigenous language. The definition of indigenous language has been um, limited somewhat to specific language families, and it specifically excludes Afrikaans. Um, the same kind of idea mentioned about development is reiterated here. The persistent underdevelopment and undervaluing of indigenous languages should not be allowed if public higher in education institutions are to meet the diverse linguistic needs of their student population. And of course, this is an inherently paradoxical situation because on the one hand, we have another indigenous language. Afrikaans is most certainly an indigenous language. Um, according to many scholars, it's our only indigenous language that has been fully developed, um, that has a full academic and literary publishing um, history, that has all of these cultural and linguistic resources, and it could very well serve as a model for the other indigenous languages to be developed to a similar level. And yet, it is not seen to be appreciated by the relevant department because um, it is not seen to be indigenous. And um, it's quite a shame that the department um, has chosen to go this way. It's an issue that my own university has taken up with them and we've noted our protest and the fact that we definitely see Afrikaans as an indigenous language spoken by a significant proportion of our population. Um, it feels a bit like reinventing the wheel. If one doesn't acknowledge the fact that you have Afrikaans as a resource um, and you exclude it as one of the indigenous languages, it leaves it in a sort of limbo. Um, there are also um, talks of the funding models for universities being adjusted and um, universities being forced to use English and two indigenous languages, um, which leaves questions as to what will happen with Afrikaans in that kind of setup. Um, but there is a lot of politics um, below the surface as well that I probably shouldn't put on record too strongly. The question I have um, and that I'd like to start um, closing off my talk with is um, whether it makes sense to take away an existing resource from an underprivileged minority um, community based on an outdated political opinion about the history of a certain part of that community. Um, it seems that the association of Afrikaans with the apartheid government um, leads our current government to want it to be scrapped um, in higher education at least because they're not having it seen as an indigenous language, although it very clearly is. Um, and this is a difficult issue and it's a relevant issue. It's an issue that's very much open for discussion at the moment and that we're looking into um, at my own institution and at other institutions. Um, at my own institution, um, we've gone through various iterations of different language policies. We are in fact one of the um, HAUs, the Historically Afrikaans Universities. We were seen for very long to be an Afrikaans university in um, the recent two language policies that we've um, written up. We have seen the um, greater prevalence of English um, after the fees must fall protests of 2015 and afterwards, um, the decision was taken that all academic content at our institutions should be available at least in English. 
um, with significant portions still being available in Afrikaans as well. Um, there were many um, media events and many um, discussions and protests and the like, um, notable among which the so-called Leicester video in which a small group of black students indicated their dissatisfaction and disadvantagement as a result of having to do certain things in Afrikaans and on an Afrikaans campus. Um, there was pushback from the other side as well with an equivalent video called Listen being made um, later on with Afrikaans students in indicating their disenfranchisement in terms of not being able to use their language. And so it's another indication of a linguistic human rights approach not really being the solution because um, if you guarantee people equal rights but those rights are mutually exclusive, you do have a bit of a problem. Um, in our 2016 language policy for which our university received a lot of bad press and a lot of negative commentary, um, there was a shift from Afrikaans being the primary language to English being the primary language with Afrikaans fulfilling a supporting role. There was also an important shift of um, the Afrikaans versions of documents no longer being the default valid version in case of court cases and so forth, but the English version being that and the Afrikaans being a translation. Our policy is now open for revision. Um, I've been working on the group who has to revise it. Um, there was a first round of public commentary in which there was significant public commentary. And the second draft is now open for, um, for commentary um, after revision. Um, I can show you what this, um, all of this looks like. Um, it's on a website that indicates the various versions of the document. Um, and I think for those of you interested in language policy as such, um, this document can be especially interesting. Um, because this indicates where changes were applied um, in the second draft of the policy. You'll see that significant um, input has been added. Sorry, I just have a, a dog talking to me as well. Um, significant changes have been brought about um, in terms of an evaluation and a, um, an appreciation of multilingualism. Um, and we've also um, added many um, practical steps like translanguaging and so forth. So um, you're welcome to have a look at that. Um, and this is just to indicate the kinds of things that we're busy with in our institution. One of the few institutions where um, we did not simply go for saying, well, to hell with all the other languages, we're just doing everything in English for now. Although um, for people who feel very strongly about Afrikaans and who have good reason to feel very strongly about Afrikaans, um, of course, there is always um, too much English and not enough Afrikaans. So um, you're welcome to have a look at that um, at your own leisure. Um, the basic idea with our language policy is to embrace multilingualism, including things like languaging, um, and to include the public and our students in constructing the new policy. We're not entirely clear on the issue of the indigenous language aspect relating to Afrikaans, um, as I said before, from a research perspective and from a scholarly perspective, Afrikaans is most definitely an indigenous language and trying to make it out as anything else is simply a political move. And um, yes, we are pushing back against that as far as we can. But of course, um, laws and legislation come from above. And um, at the end of the day, we have to submit to them um, if we want to be part of the people living in a country. So we do have to follow the rules, but um, we are noting our protest in this regard because this has massive implications for all the other languages. If a well-developed academic language like Afrikaans um, can this easily be scrapped, um, we are probably on a very slippery slope to a situation where English will be the only language of um, higher education and later on of formal basic education as well and we don't want that. Um, and that's basically my whole story. So thank you very much for affording me the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you. And I would welcome some um, questions and discussion. Uh, right at the end of my slides, you'll also see um, a list of references. It's not an exhaustive list. It, lo it notes the most important ones. If anything is unclear, you're welcome to, um, yes, to contact me for some more details. So that's the presentation and I'll welcome any questions. I'm just going to
stop sharing my screen here. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much for this talk. And um, we have received quite a few questions that I'm just going to pass on. So um, one is regarding the basic education system, because you did talk about um, university languages and how is basic education or school um, system, how, how is it, um, how how is that important on is it on uh, in english is it on uh, the uh, different languages that they have and do all languages have a writing system so that's one question and then i'm gonna pass the other one okay uh, let me start off with that one yes um i did skip over that to a certain extent um the education system that we used to have before 1994 um it doesn't um exist officially any longer so on paper we have a system where um, children are able to go to school in the language in any of the official languages of their choice basically um, these languages all have writing systems as well um, what we see in practice is that um, children tend to be able to have their basic um, sort of their kindergarten level schooling in their home language but by the age of nine or 10, by what we call grade four, they typically switch to English only if they speak any other language than Afrikaans. Afrikaans still goes on up to the grade 12 level where they leave school. So um, in the school system as well, Afrikaans and English are very prevalent with the other languages um, basically only having a supporting role and a limited subject choice presented in those languages. They are presented as language subjects but very little subject content is produced or presented in those languages. Um, so this is actually a remnant of the previous system that we're still working on. I hope that answers the question. Um, I think it does. And then uh, a follow-up question to that is, uh, what are the language requirements for um, university access? Uh, do they have to present a, a language requirement test? And then um, how do people associate to language given that most of the education is imported in English and then what makes them not give up their own language and just people start speaking English um, in order to have access to, um, to, to job uh, or mm -hmm. education, as you mentioned. Yes, that, that is, unfortunately, that is exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing the fact that English is becoming even more prevalent for the fact that it has this prestige value. Um, it has a value um, in the eyes of the public of being able to give them more opportunities and greater social mobility. So there is a very strong shift, um, even from Afrikaans speaking people to rather use English. I mean, in, in my university, where we offer many courses in parallel medium with Afrikaans and English, you'll have even the Afrikaans students going to the English class and saying, well, I'm going to work in English anyway. So what's the point of studying in Afrikaans? So um, this, this is a massive problem. In terms of the entry requirements, um, we have a system of um, what we call, um, uh, we used to call it matriculation um, exemption, I think it was called in English, but it's basically, it's a system of a specific combination of subjects that you need to have access to university. So for the universities, this would typically be, um, you would have to have mathematics and you would have to have certain minimum marks in two languages. So your home language and your first additional language. Um, again, um, English is generally a requirement because um, you can't really get your grade 12 certificate if English isn't at least one of your two subjects. So um, our school children tend to have English at least at a first additional level, but most of them, uh, many of them have it as a home language level subject, even though it's not the actual language they speak at home um, with all the subsequent educational difficulties that follows from that. But, but we are seeing a massive shift away from all our other languages to English because of these reasons. Thank you. And um, we, we've got another question uh, from Jose Alvarez. He's asking, is it the case that Africans is somewhat tainted by the fact that original being a Creole language? Um, yes, I think not so much by the fact that it was a Creole language. Um, 
I think for very long in the standardization of Afrikaans, um, the people working on it at the time did not want to acknowledge that it started as a Creole language. Of course, nowadays, we generally see that all languages start as Creoles in some way. Um, I don't think Afrikaans is tainted by that. I think Afrikaans is tainted by the fact that it was made out to be a white language for so long and that it was so closely associated with the nationalist government. Um, so yes, Afrikaans definitely has a number of negative connotations. Um, and in, in, in big parts of the Afrikaans speech community, people are saying, well, why does it care about us now, all of a sudden? Um, uh, and a large proportion of speakers will say, well, this largest variety, COPS, it has been there all along without the protection that the standard variety has. So why would you want to pull it into the standard now? It's going to be fine on its own. Um, and that's not an invalid point. We see more and more literature being published in the um, carps variety and so forth. So it's a very, a very vibrant and growing variety. But um, yes, uh, the standard version is definitely painted. Thank you. And um, I have uh, perhaps a last question. Um, and it, it caught my attention um, given the linguistic reality here in Colombia. So um, it, it is said that um, there are about 60, seven, 69 different languages spoken in Colombia besides Spanish. Um, and we do have uh, many differences from what you showed us from uh, the linguistic policy and also our constitution doesn't recognize uh, national languages, just one national language where speakers, speakers of different languages are, uh, they have their own language and their territory and that's fine, but um, there's no such thing in the constitution that their language is also official in the national territory. Um, so it caught my attention uh, when you mentioned um, perhaps your, your uh, second to last slide um, about translanguaging and how, how to implement that into education. And I wanted to ask you, um, how, how are you guys thinking about translanguaging being included in the education system? Um, the biggest issue that we've we have to deal with is that we have these 11 official languages and we don't have them on equal footing in formal education um, but we have the children speaking those 11 languages all over in the formal education system um, and i think the the translanguaging is firstly about recognition um, and of course about the pedagogical value that we have when people can use their own language um, in our classes, for example, you would typically have um, a group of, let's say, 200 or 300 first year students, and you'll have at least six or seven of the, ind the um, indigenous languages, speakers having those languages as their own language in that group, even though they're all studying English. And the idea with the translanguaging is twofold. It's firstly about being more open and welcoming and not, not forcing people into their second or third language when they're still struggling to grow, to learn concepts and to, you know, to start to grasp with, um, or grapple with things. Um, but also it's about the, the very practical issue of um, getting these languages on a more equal footing and showing our kids that, you know, you don't need to study only in English um, to develop yourself and to develop your knowledge. English is not the only way in which you can do that. I think we're all very aware of the, the, the teaching and learning value of using the student's first language and um, that would be a very specific goal in mind to, to develop those languages as well. Um, at the moment, we don't really see an incentive from government or from any other formal institution to develop these languages. Um, Afrikaans developed to the point where it is now because of massive investment from the government at the time. Um, and we're basically looking at ways to do that from the bottom up and translanguaging seems to us to be one of the ways in which we can do that. Um, our country has a, has a very bad history with people being told to use one language. We had, I mean, when the British took over from the Dutch, for example, um, they anglicized the schools, the churches, everything. I mean, children would be, they would get a set of donkey ears to wear if they dared speak Afrikaans in a classroom. Um, so we've been, I mean, we've been marred and tainted by that kind of history. And there's a long history of people 
being forced to speak a specific language if they want to fit into a specific space. So translanguaging is basically a pushback against that, um, welcoming the languages into that space and showing people that you can use your own language at every level of society. That's the, that's the ideal. I mean, it's not, in practical terms, I mean, as somebody who teaches myself, um, it's not that easy, but it's something we really, we really want to create an environment for. And in that sense, um, do you expect teachers or instructor to be multilingual in all of the different kids' languages? No, no, that would never be feasible. Um, we, I think English would very much remain the basis, um, but I think it's a, it's a matter of utilizing what you have at the time when you have it. Um, typically, there will be more than one speaker of a given language in a given group. So you can, um, I mean, you can do it differently. You can divide the, the bigger groups into smaller groups and, you know, separate them per language or spread them out per language. And people can learn each other's terminology and develop terminology and develop conceptual issues and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, but that would very much be without the, um, with, with the lecturer or the tutor taking the role of a facilitator, um, which is also something we feel very strongly about, um, sort of equalizing that relationship with all the, all the pedagogical um, advantages that holds. Mm. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna pass. Uh, I'm uh, I'm gonna try to combine two uh, questions that we've got from Mauricio Ramirez and David Alarcón. So Maris, Mauricio is asking, um, how is the South African government protecting minority languages from disappearing? And and Perhaps it has to do something with the question from David Alarcón, who's asking, has social linguistic help in some way to uh, solve this um, linguistic and identity issues? Yes, I think um, I'll start with the social linguistic issue. Yes, I think the social linguists are probably the people who have the best perspective on these issues um, because um, for so long there's been this artificial separation of the economy and education and language as though they're separate things. And it was, I mean, it was social linguists like, um, like Neville Alexander and numerous others who first said to, to fix a fractured society like South Africa, you need to have a set of policies that sees the economy, the land issue and education as a whole, because you can't separate these things out. And I think the social linguists probably have the best perspective on the potentials and potentialities of language in that regard. Um, regarding the protection of the minority languages, um, I probably shouldn't say that government is doing nothing, um, but it's close to nothing. Um, there just isn't an incentive. If you go at, if you look at our governing parties, own policy documents from the late eighties and so forth at the CODESA talks and at the talks for the new, um, for the new constitution, language was never a priority for the ANC. Um, it was sort of assumed that it would be English. Um, and I think they were basically caught off guard by the insistence upon all the other languages and upon Afrikaans from the Afrikaans negotiators. And they saw this 11 issue as kind of a, you know, just, just everybody's pacified and happy because all the languages have equal rights and not really thinking about the implications of what would be expected of those rights. But yes, very little. Um, if any of your, um, if any of the audience members want to just go and Google PANSOLB, for example, and try to find out what they are doing and see the kind of problems they're facing, it's it's quite clear that there's not not much is happening, unfortunately. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Svart. and um, this has been very inspiring, and, and I think we do we. We do get a feeling that um, we've got similar issues on how to solve multilingualism in a so so we get these different settings where you may get everyone to just speak one language and make just one national language or try to face this uh, difficult um, multilingual setting uh, that we we do need to find different ways of uh, tackling this. So. Um, Thank you very much for your talk. Um, and we expect to be able to see you in person in, in a different um, non-COVID um, situation in the future. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much.
I really hope so. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening. I hope you could follow everything. And um, I think you have a copy of my slideshow. So you're welcome to distribute it to the participants if you want. Um, it also has my email address if anybody wants to get in contact with me. So thank you very much for the opportunity once again. Great, thank you. A todos, muchas gracias por eh, habernos acompañado. El profesor Marius dice que eh, nos va a prestar las, las diapositivas para quienes quieran eh, poder eh, acceder a ellas, a los links que él puso. Y mm, los esperamos entonces en nuestra próxima en nuestra próxima sesión que va a ser el 23 de agosto eh, les confirmamos por eh, en, en las en, en nuestras redes y mm, vamos a estar eh, hablando también con eh, alguien que tiene una experiencia muy grande pero esta vez en México en, en, con la profesora Aileen quien ha trabajado durante 25 30 años eh, con profesores indígenas en México y cómo aplicar eh, procesos de educación en la propia lengua. Entonces, eh, a todos muchas gracias por hacer parte de este seminario en el que nos estamos preguntando sobre lenguaje y, y en este año sobre políticas multilingües eh, y políticas lingüísticas eh, como parte de la, de la Cátedra UNESCO en la, de la que hace parte el Instituto Caricuervo. Los esperamos entonces. Muchas gracias por su, su participación.